so I'm thankful for that. What I'd like to do is just share our announcement that we got this morning, which is rhubarb pies. We got, how many do we have or are planning to have? What's the goal? A couple hundred, maybe? Maybe. So if you want pies... Okay, and I think I've seen some in my father-in-law's garden, so I'll have to see if he, because I know you said you could use some more rhubarb. So there is a, a call for rhubarb if you got it hanging out in your garden area, and if you want a pie, be putting in an order for that. With that, I'm going to invite Janet up here, and we're going to get started. Oh, we got another one. Arthur, go ahead. Oh, Okay. Sure. Nice. All right, so I don't know if you guys all caught that or those listening online, we've been talking about getting a digital sign out front, and we went from estimates of 26000 to where we're now looking at something quite reasonable. So I'm going to keep you all in suspense. Arthur's got some stuff to share with us, but we have been looking at that. Many of you have been following along with that for some time now. So with that, let me just pray for our time. And we'll get started with worship. God, we just come before you right now and quiet our hearts and our minds. And we ask, Lord, that you would come and be a part of every part of this service, from the worship to the message to Sunday school to even the discussion of plans about a sign. God, we ask for your guidance and your wisdom. And most importantly, God, we ask for you to be present in our lives. Lord, we know that's where wisdom is found. We know that's where guidance is found. And God, we just ask that you would just speak to us through this time. And we thank you for our church family. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand. 
Thank you, Janet. Please be seated. That song reminds me when I was a kid, growing up and hearing that song in the Catholic Church. Thank you so much for that, Janet. And I want to take some time to just reflect on that song. You know, I think it goes hand in hand with what we're going to be looking at this morning. And really, it just goes part and parcel with the Christian life. I mean, first and foremost, we're to seek God and His righteousness. And that is what we are called as Christians to do. And we just want to reflect on that or keep that, I guess, in our minds this morning as we go into our, our study here in just a few minutes after our prayer time. But just want to touch on that. I think that is so important. It's foundational and it fits with what we're talking about this morning. So, as is our custom, I'd like to give everyone opportunity to share any prayer requests they might have, praise reports. I uh, want to make sure we have opportunity to do that as a church family. And Randy's got the mic, and it looks like... Oh, it, Randy's got one, yeah. Just like to welcome Nan, <laughs> Nana and Papa this morning. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Nana Lou and Papa Terry. That's right. Thank you. Thanks, Randy. I'm just so thankful for this wonderful church family. They have just come and, and gathered around Keith and I, and I want to thank everyone that's brought food. Everything's been so delicious, and everything's different, and it's wonderful. It has really, really helped us. So I'm just privileged to, to be here with this wonderful, caring church family. Thank you. Thanks, Denise. I think we need to remember the Kolakowski family after we served their funeral luncheon this week. Um, Barb Rockwell was over this morning, and Phil is had his surgery this week. He's doing okay. He's not running any races, but he's gaining a little bit each day, a little bit stronger, and she said to keep remembering them. Okay. Also, too, I'd like to just continue to ask that we pray for, for Rob Smith. Uh, many of you know he's just been uh, kind of laid up here over the last week with surgery and his uh, removal of some larger kidney stones. And then he had his second COVID shot and it did not treat him real well. So on top of everything else, he just, he said he was coming down from a pretty high fever. And, and so just want to continue to pray for Rob, uh, for Connie. Still waiting, it sounds like, uh, Connie Wedge, for some news uh, with uh, Henry Ford and what they're going to be doing. And then, of course, my wife's family. Uh, I just want to continue. I know you guys have been super faithful with praying for our family and for her grandfather's passing uh, this past week. And so this Friday is going to be his service. It's going to be a gravesite service over in Bay City. So just keep us in your prayers for this coming Friday and just for the family. And again, his wife's name is Carol. So if you do that, that would be great. Let's take all of these things to the Lord right now. God, we are so thankful for our family. I'm thankful for my family. I'm thankful for my parents being here and the sacrifices that they made to, to come and visit and spend time and to pour into our family. And of course, God, we're thankful for church family. God, we're thankful, as uh, Deneen mentioned this morning, her thankfulness, her gratitude for this church family. God, we are thankful for family and what family does. Church family, what uh, the biological family is supposed to do, God, that we come together and love on each other and help each other. And God, we just want to lift up people now. As a church family, we want to lift up those who are hurting uh, God, we pray for the Kowalewski family, Lord. We just lift them up to you and just the, the hurt and the pain and the, 
the grieving and just the healing that needs to take place, God, we pray for that family. God, we pray for Phil and the strength that he needs. We pray for just, uh, just mercy and grace on his life. And God, we pray for, Bro- for Rob and for healing, and we ask, God, that you just would help him and to bring healing to, to his body from the, just the adverse effects from the shot and just uh, his surgery and everything. God, I pray that you would move in his body. And Lord, we ask that you'd be with Connie and that you just would help the timing to be perfect for what needs to take place for her down at Henry Ford. And Lord, she asks specifically, God, for peace with however your will plays out. And so, God, we just ask you to continue to give Connie peace. And, Lord, we pray for, for my wife's family. God, we ask that you would move in their lives and that you'd bring peace into the family's hearts and minds this week as we grieve the loss of Grandpa Pete. And, God, we just pray all these things. And there's so many. There's so many hurts. There's so many uh, things to be also grateful for in our world that, God, we want to take a moment to say thank you and also to ask you to just uh, be, be with us as we work through the difficulties in this life and also as we celebrate times that are so joyful, God, we want to give you praise for those. We want to give you praise both in the times that we're on the mountaintop and in the valley. And Lord, we just pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, as We've been doing now for a number of weeks as we've been going through Mark's gospel. And we have been looking at this primary goal that Mark had, which was to make sure people understood and would later, of course, people that would live after Mark. Mark was really certain that his words were inspired words. And that he wanted people that he was writing to right then in his generation to know about Jesus. But then he wanted those who would live after him to know about who Jesus was. And of course, this knowledge was meant to turn into belief, right? To trust in Jesus, to have faith in him. And that was the goal, to know Jesus and to trust him and have faith in him. And so over the past several weeks, we've observed how intentional Mark was with his Holy Spirit-inspired placement of content, right? He placed his content in specific ways. He described Jesus' life very strategically. And over and over, we've seen how considering the context is essential in helping us understand the meaning and message of the text, Right? Context was essential as we've seen all along so far and understand the text, and we're going to find that again today. Now, sometimes I think that word context is thrown around, and we're like, what does that mean? So there's different meanings of the word context. Here's one definition for you Context, defined as the parts of a written or spoken statement that precedes, so goes before, or follows a specific word or passage usually influencing its meaning or effect. That's from goodolddictionary.com, all right? So there are, of course, other meanings of context, but that is what we're talking about. So when we're looking at the context of a passage, we're asking, what was said before? What was said immediately after? And how does that help us to understand the meaning of what we are reading? So once again, we're going to be paying close attention to the context of Mark chapter 12. I've got... A wonderful slide for you. So check it out here. I want to, Charlotte, take a look at this. I'm calling out just because you like hearts. Look at that one right there, huh? All right, so we've got ourselves a slide, and this is all about what's going on in Mark chapter 12. Mark chapter 12 has seven different sections, and at the heart of Mark chapter 12 is the greatest commandments. So it all kind of funnels in, and everything before it and everything after it helps us to answer some questions that we're going to be looking at this morning. So let me tell you where we're headed. We're going to read and focus on the greatest commandments. We're going to look at this clear reference that Jesus made about the Messiah being Lord. We're going to talk about how Jesus condemned the attention-seeking religious leaders, the scribes and their poor leadership, and how Jesus commended this widow. And her offering. And what we're going to specifically do though today with looking at the context is we're going to do this. 
we're going to answer two questions. You guys ready for the questions? The questions are, how do we practically love God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, with all of our strength? How do we do that? Right? Jesus says we're going to look at today, that's the greatest commandment, but how do we practically do that in each of our lives? How do we love God with everything in us? And then secondly, how do we love our neighbor as ourself? How do we practically do that? So that's what we're going to be answering today as we see uh, these different stories or sections discussed. Now, sections one through three we discussed last week, right? We looked at the parable of the vineyard. We looked at the temple tax. We looked at knowing scripture and God's power. So I'm going to just briefly go through those and then we'll get to the heart of it, the greatest commandment. So the vineyard parable. We ready for this? The vineyard parable, I'm just reminding you, this is what we looked at last week. Jesus is disappointed with the religious leaders because they did not produce fruit. They were not bearing good fruit or they lacked any fruit. That's the parable, right? And Jesus says, remember, I am looking for fruit. My father, the owner in the parable, the owner of the, of the vineyard was looking for fruit and he didn't get it. He was looking for fruitfulness. And so what we can see here when we think about context of Mark chapter 12 and how does it answer the question, how do we love God with everything in us? How do we love our neighbor as ourself? Let's ask this question. Are we producing good fruit? That would be one way to ask, are we doing that well? How can we answer that question in each of our lives? Am I loving God with everything in me? Am I loving my neighbor as myself? The question is, are we producing good fruit? Because the answer to that will help us to know if we're loving God with everything in us and if we are loving our neighbor as ourselves. Next, we see here the temple tax. Oh, well, let me point out one more thing. Let me take us here real quick. In that vineyard parable, let me take your minds there. So last week, Jesus is telling this parable about these people, the tenants that were taking care of the vineyard. The owner sent people to collect the fruit, right? They tr mistreat the, the people that came to collect the fruit. And at the very end, the religious leaders not in the parable, but in real life who Jesus was teaching the parable to, they get upset because they realize that that parable was spoken about them and they want to kill Jesus. That's the very opposite, right? Because Jesus is God. So that's the very opposite of loving God, right? I mean, it's about as obvious as you can get. So when we think about how this parable in this very first section, Mark 12, is answering the question of the greatest commandments. Do we love God with everything in us? Are we loving our neighbor as ourselves? That first section is telling us we need to make sure that our love for God is always first and foremost, right? Because the religious leaders had become preoccupied with their own interests, with their own traditions, with the extra teachings that they held so high. And they had let go or pushed aside their love for God and his commands. We should never let the extra, whatever it is, supersede our love of God. How about the temple tax? How does the temple tax, remember Jesus says, give to Caesar what is Caesar, give to God what is God's. How does that answer the question practically, am I loving God with everything in me? And am I loving my neighbor as myself? How does that answer it? Because remember, we're looking at context and how this context helps to answer the greatest commandments questions that I'm raising this morning. How does that do that? Well, Jesus, in this answer, give to Caesar what is Caesar and give to God what is God's, he reminds us there's always going to be systems, right? Anybody feel like right now there are systems in this world and leaders in this world that are not doing things that God's pleased with? Yeah. Yeah. There's plenty of that, right? There's plenty of that going on. There's always going to be systems and leaders, and some are going to be good, some are going to be bad. And the Bible states that God either directly, and here's the thing, this is the reality. The Bible states that God either directly puts those leaders in place or allows them to be in power for a period of time, even though they're not always honoring him or serving others well. Because why? We deal with sin nature. 
Every one of us deal with sin nature or with the sin that's in our own lives. There is sin nature that we all deal with, we all have a free will, and we live in a broken, fallen world. So that's the reality. So this happens, and we must not lose heart when someone rises to power that does not honor God, because ultimately God is still on the throne, right? But specifically to what we're talking about, Remember, the Bible gives us examples of plenty of people who are very successful in systems that were quite pagan or antagonistic to God's ways, right? Think about Moses. Think about Joseph. Think about Esther. Think about Mordecai. Think about Daniel. These are all people in the Bible that are examples to us that they learn to adapt and work within systems that still without compromising their beliefs. And we see that in each of those cases that I just shared of those people, there are times where they realize if I go any farther with what they're asking me to do, I'm going to have to compromise. And we see those people push back in those situations. But those are the rare exceptions For the most part, everyone I just shared, they learned to work within the systems and with the leaders that they were dealt with, right? So here's the point. For the most part, there is this biblical principle of giving to Caesar what is Caesar's and giving to God what is God's. And this principle helps us to see how love for God must always be first. It's our guide, even to help us when we are find ourselves in a system or being led by leaders that are not honoring God. And it helps us too. When we think about this principle of giving to Caesar what is Caesar and giving to God what is God's, it helps us to get along with and love our neighbor who thinks quite differently than us. We talked about that last week. It also helps us to love and to shine in this world even when we have people that are not only thinking differently than us, but are actually treating us quite unkindly, right? And so all of this is helping us to answer the question, how do we practically love God and love others? What about the Sadducees? Last week, we're going to spend a little bit of time with the Sadducees here because it connects us with Our teaching, or our primary passage this morning, so I'm going to look back over this, but also it contains a key answer to our question of how do we love God? How do we love others practically? So let me take you back to it. Let's read Mark 12, 28. And one of the scribes came, and having heard them reasoning together and perceiving that he had answered them well, asked them, which is the first commandment of all? I threw that in the old King Jimmy version because I know many of you like the King James. So I threw that in there. And the question is there. And it's it's being asked. And if we just picked up our study this morning in verse 28, we wouldn't necessarily make a connection what was just happening. So last week, we looked at the question the Sadducees raised. This is verse 28. Verse 28 is... The scribe is noticing that Jesus gave a good answer to the question the Sadducees had raised last week. What was that question? Who were the Sadducees first off? That was a whole week ago, right, when we talked about them. Good to be refreshed. The Sadducees was a small group of people. They were this small elite group of Jewish people who were quite wealthy, quite influential, even though they were small in size. And they were kind of an odd group, too, because they only believed in the first five books of the Bible. And in the first five books of the Bible is kind of where they they said, okay, that's authoritative. Anything past that stops. Or at least we don't hold as authoritative. And so they pull out this hypothetical question because one other odd thing about the Sadducees is they didn't believe in an afterlife. All right? So they decide, let's throw out this hypothetical question. Based off of Deuteronomy 25, 5 through 7. So Deuteronomy 25, 5 through 7 says this. If, a br- if brothers are living together and one of them dies without a son, his widow must not marry outside the family. Her husband's brother shall take her and marry her and fulfill the duty of a brother-in-law to her. 
The first son she bears shall carry on the name of the dead brother, so that his name will not be blotted out from Israel. However, it goes on verse 7, if a man does not want to marry his brother's wife, she'll go before the elders. And basically, there is a way out. So the, the brother-in-law didn't have to fulfill his duty, but it was kind of like a, a shameful act to not do so. So the hypothetical question the Sadducees raise is coming from this thought. And the Sadducees ask this question. Jesus, remember, they don't believe in an afterlife. And so they want to throw this question to Jesus. They said, Jesus, suppose there are seven brothers who one after another die after marrying the same widow. None of them have kids. So they asked, who's going to be the legitimate husband and wife in, hes in heaven? Let's think about that question for a second. One more time. Who's going to be the legitimate husband and wife in heaven? Have any of you ever had that thought? I mean, there are many people who lose a spouse and get remarried. How does that work in heaven, right? I mean, who's going to be the legitimate husband and wife in heaven? In fact, what the Sadducees were trying to do were trying to make it seem like the belief in an afterlife is kind of silly. Because if you believe in an afterlife, it's going to get really messy. If everyone raises from the dead, there's going to be all sorts of problems. So that's what the Sadducees are asking. Who's going to be the real husband and wife when, when this uh, resurrection takes place, Jesus? And look at Jesus' response. We looked at this last week, but very briefly, Jesus responds, Are you not in error because you do not know the scriptures or the power of God? When the dead rise, they will neither marry nor be given in marriage. They will be like the angels in heaven. Now, about the dead rising, have you not read in the book of Moses, in the account of the burning bush, how God said to him, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. You are badly mistaken. I said to you, the reason why we're over, uh, doing an overview of this is because this here contains a key answer to our questions this morning. How do we love God practically with everything we have, and how do we love our neighbor as ourselves? This contains, or as ourselves, this contains a key answer to those questions. First off, notice here, that Jesus basically says this. Here's a thought back to you, Sadducees. You're trying to make it seem silly that there's this belief in the afterlife. Well, he answers it right here. He says, when the dead rise, they will neither marry nor be given in marriage. They'll be like the angels. So when we rise and when we, go, and when we are in heaven, marriage won't look like it does here on earth. It's going to be different. But more importantly, I think to our, to our study this morning, is he answers it by first saying, you're an heir because you do not know the scriptures or the power of God. And then he says, you are trying to throw this at me to seem silly, but he said, you believe in Exodus, right? What do we say about the Sadducees? They believe in the first five books, right? Genesis, Exodus, right? So this is one of those books they hold authoritative. And he says, in Exodus, God himself says, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. How insignificant would that be if those guys are just dead old people that lived some time before? See, Jesus says the significance is that these guys who lived in the past, God raised them up and are now in a relationship with him eternally. That's why Jesus says here, they are or God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. That's what makes it significant. So when God says, I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, it's significant because they have now been risen from the dead, living with God eternally forever. That makes it significant. All right? But the most important thing about this to answer our question is this, and I don't want us to miss this. How in the world do we practically love God and others if we don't know the scriptures. That's what Jesus says here. How do we understand God and his power? We know the scriptures. You see, 
we need to know what the Bible says in order to actually do it, right? I mean, think about it from this standpoint. Let me go here, right here for a second. This is verse 27, and it goes into 31. These are the greatest commandments that I believe you guys are familiar with and that I've been referring to this morning. Jesus is asked by a scribe, after hearing that he had given a good response to the Sadducees, what are the greatest commandments? How do you and I know what the greatest commandments are? In fact, how do we know anything about God? Because they're recorded in a Bible, right? All of what God wanted us to have is Holy Spirit inspired and been preserved in the Word of God. So indirectly, these two greatest commandments that we find in the Bible are telling us we need to know the Bible in order to even follow them, right? So when Jesus says here, what are the two greatest commandments? We see here he responds, love God with everything in you, essentially, and love your neighbor as yourself. But we find that the answer, let me take you right back to this slide, is right before this. See, we have these sections. The context helps us to understand the heart of Mark chapter 12. No scripture in God's power. The only way we're going to really know that we're supposed to love God with everything in us is if we know scripture. Because we wouldn't know those commands if we didn't know scripture. And here's the other thing. If we didn't know scripture or God's power, how could we fulfill what God's asking us to do by loving our neighbor? You see, what we find here is not only this call to know scripture, but also to live it out. And we find out that the source of our strength is found in God, and that is told to us in scripture, right? Everything we know about God is found in scripture, we see here that when we think about what love looks like, so that's why Jesus, it's so important that Jesus says right before what the greatest commandments are is you, you guys need to know scripture and the power of God because that is what is foundational to be able to fulfill the greatest commandments. That we understand the source of true power when we know scripture because the source of true power is God. And God, through the Holy Spirit, gives us the ability to have, through his and our loving relationship, right? Our loving relationship with God then gives us the power to love others well. That's what we find. But we need to know that scripture. And then we, then we see in scripture all these great examples about love, right? Love defined in scripture in very practical ways, like Kind of the 1 Corinthians 13 type stuff, right? Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious. It's not arrogant. It's not boastful. It's not rude. All those things are examples for us of what love actually looks like according to God. And then Jesus is this great example, of course, of what love looks like. We need all that to practically carry out the greatest commandments. You guys, I'm going to share something with you I think is interesting. So the NIV Study Bible says that rabbis actually counted 613 individual commands. 613 individual commands were counted. And they placed them in two categories. Those that were the big ones, they called them the heavies, and those that were the light, those that weren't as significant. And in Jesus' day, there was a famous rabbi who said everything can be summed up as love. And so what we see here, Jesus saying, is what some other rabbis were thinking. But what I find significant and what goes with our study is Jesus' response points us right back to our need to know Scripture. Let me tell you why. Because when we go to this passage where it says here, uh, yes, the most important one, Answer Jesus is this, hear O Israel. Why does Jesus open with hear O Israel? He's not like telling everyone, hey, listen up, guys. I mean, that'd be kind of odd, right? He's, that's not what he's saying. He's literally quoting Deuteronomy. So when we read that, 
When he's asked, what is the greatest commandment? Jesus doesn't go to some extra biblical teaching. He doesn't quote some current rabbi that's influential. Jesus quotes scripture. And so when we find the question that we've raised, how do we love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love our neighbor as ourselves, we need to remember the answer primarily lies first and foremost, do we know scripture and the power of God? Because Jesus, when he's asked the question, what's the greatest commandment? He quotes scripture, Deuteronomy 6, 4 not, uh, through 9. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your strength. These commandments that I give today, and this is, of course, Moses reiterating this to the Israelites. And then we see this follow-up, though. Jesus doesn't miss a beat, right? When we go back here, Jesus doesn't miss a beat. He says this in verse 31, the second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There's no commandment greater than these. And this commandment that he gave, uh, the second one, is again him quoting scripture. This is in Leviticus. In Leviticus, it says here that you are to love your neighbor as yourself. And so we see here that Jesus is calling us to know scripture because that is a very practical way for us to love God. Because we won't know what it looks like to love God. And here's a, here's a real simple question. How do we know what God is like? We know what God is like through scripture, right? He revealed himself through Jesus, the word, and through the written word in the most significant and clear ways. That's how, we are not able to love someone very well that we don't know. Fair? Fair? The way we fall in love with God is by getting to know him, by understanding him. And so Jesus, and of course Mark, inspired by the Holy Spirit, made it very uh, strategically placed to put that story right before the greatest commandments. Jesus says, you're an heir because you don't know scripture, and you don't know the power of God. When we know scripture, not exhaustively, right? But when we have a good grasp on scripture and God's power, then we're able to, to fulfill God's commandments. It's interesting because there's a very similar discussion of what we're talking about found in Luke. In Luke's gospel, in the 10th chapter, someone comes to Jesus and wants to know how he can inherit eternal life. And this guy actually responds that I'm supposed to love God with everything in me, and I'm supposed to love my neighbor. And Jesus commends the man for such a good response. And then the guy follows up and he says, but who's my neighbor? Do you know where I'm going with this story? And Jesus tells a parable, and he tells a very famous parable. He tells the parable of the Good Samaritan, right? And in that story, we know a man is traveling, and when he's traveling, he comes upon some robbers who treat him ruthlessly and leave him half dead. And two religious leaders walk by, apparently because they don't want to have uh, the potential of becoming unclean for a period of time, and they leave the man and don't help him. But the Samaritan comes and rescues the man and takes care of him, shows him the word of God, says pity, compassion. What is all that? Love. And there's a couple of things we need to drive home here to answer our question. Because what's our question this morning, guys? How do we love God practically with everything in us? And how do we love those around us as we love ourselves? Well, Jesus is making it clear. So Jesus said, hey, I'm going to quote Leviticus where it says, love your neighbor at yourself, as yourself. But we know that in that context, many Jews might have thought they were just talking about their own Jewish people. But Jesus comes on the scene, God in the flesh, and when we see in another gospel him sharing this same sort of conversation, he says, we are to love others, and here's, as yourself, and here's an example of your neighbor, anyone who's in need. So you see, what makes the Samaritan story so impactful is that the Samaritan was someone that the Jews loathed. They did not like the Samaritans. And Jesus makes the Samaritan man the hero. And he reaches out. And so Jesus is telling us, and of course the NIV study Bible, other pastors, scholars have pointed out that Jesus is saying love has no ethnic uh, 
has no national boundaries. We are to love everyone, right? And can you guys agree with me? There isn't anything our world needs more than some good love right now, right? How about that song from the 60s, all right? Hal David, what the world needs now, right, is love. So how many of you guys are already thinking that before I even said it, right? What the world needs now is love, sweet love. And we all resonate with that. We're like, absolutely. But then we ask the question, God, you're telling me to love you with everything in me and to love my neighbor. How do I do that? And Jesus says, well, let me point you to my scriptures. Because if we don't know scriptures, then we won't know how to practically do that. Jesus sets the example. He teaches us. And then we see, oh, yeah, the parable of the Good Samaritan. We're supposed to love everyone those who think differently than us, those who have the potential of making us unclean, those who have the potential of making us look inferior in the world's eyes, those who have the potential, if we help them, it's going to cost us something financially, maybe just our time. We are to love like that. Love has no national, no ethnic boundaries. That's what Jesus is saying. That's a practical way for us to love the way God is calling us to love. All right, timeless. Those are timeless principles when we think about it. So let me recap where we've been because it's easy to kind of, I've thrown a lot, but I really, I'm trying to bring it into this one focal point of answering two questions. How do we love God with everything in us and how do we love our neighbor as ourselves? And how, when I take us back to this right here, Mark, Mark chapter 12, we see context matters. Parable of the vineyard, we're just supposed to ask ourselves, are we producing good fruit? Because if we're producing good fruit, then we'll know we're, we're on our way with loving God and loving other people. How about the principle of the giving to Caesar or to Caesar's and what, to God, and what we need to do as far as giving to God what is God's? This biblical principle really is about just continuing to love and serve God despite being in a world where it's difficult to do so where we find systems and leaders that we don't agree with. We're still supposed to work with them, just like we see Joseph and others do. And we are to do the same. We are to love our neighbor who thinks and acts quite differently or even treats us not very kind. And then, of course, the source of all of this is knowing Scripture and God's power. You know, Jesus said this, and I think it's such a powerful statement. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commands. So there's kind of that answer wrapped up in there. If you love me, you'll keep my commands. How do we love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength? We do what God's asked. Now, just after this, this is what I think is so interesting. Just after this. So this kind of answers that Oh, we need to know scripture in order to keep God's commands, in order to show our love to him, right? But then what about our neighbor and how do we love our neighbor well? Just after this, the very next set of verses, we see this. This is the next verse after Jesus just said, if you love me, you'll keep my commands. Jesus says, and I will ask the Father and he'll give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the spirit of truth. He's talking about the Holy Spirit. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him for he lives with you, right? Jesus is with him right now, but then he'll be in you because the Holy Spirit, another form of of God is going to come and live inside of us and give us the power to live like we couldn't without God. What did Jesus say to the Sadducees? You're in error because you don't know scriptures and you don't know God's power. Where is God's power found that scripture teaches us? inside of us where is that power it's from god sending his holy spirit to live in us that's how we're able to actually practically love those who think differently than us i mean that song what the world need now what the world needs now is love sweet love how do we really do that in a world that's not very kind we do that through the power of god how many of you know an orphan that has a whole lot of influence how many know an orphan child that can really help other people? The idea here is Jesus is saying, without me, you don't have a lot. But Jesus is saying, I will not leave you as an orphan. I'm going to give you the power and the ability to be able to do things that change this world. Finally, let's look at this. If I go back here, 
Look, let's look at this 5, 6, and 7 section, or sections, very briefly. You know, section 4, if we look at it, Pretty straightforward, right, I think? Verses 35 through 37, well, Jesus was teaching the temple courts. This is just after Jesus said what the two greatest commandments were. He kind of delivers this knockout punch to everyone. So he silenced all of his questioners, and Jesus then goes and teaches this. Why did the teachers of the law say that the Messiah is the son of David? David himself, speaking by the Holy Spirit, declared, The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. He goes on to say, David himself calls him Lord, then how can he be his son? And the crowds just love to listen to Jesus teach. So basically what we have going on here is for David himself declares that the Messiah is the, is the Lord. And so the Messiah isn't just simply David's descendant. This is, the Messiah is someone very special, someone divine. But how does this story help answer our questions this morning? How do we love God practically with everything in us? How do we love our neighbor as ourselves? Well, remember, we're to love Jesus, right? We're to love Jesus. And if Jesus is God, then we are fulfilling what the commandment is. Love God with everything in you. And we are seeing here that Jesus is saying, love me because I am God. I'm not just the descendant of David, that's just a special guy. I am divine, and I am the tangible God that you are to love and put your love in and trust in. And then, of course, we looked at it just a second ago, right? If Jesus really is God, we need to listen to him. And if Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commands, this helps to answer that. If Jesus is saying the Messiah is the Lord, we need to listen to him, we need to listen to his commands, and that helps to answer the question practically of what we're looking at this morning. What about verses 35 through, uh, rather, 38 through 40? In 38 through 40 and 41 through 44, we have two stories, two passages, and we're going to compare and contrast them as we close. Mark 12, 38 through 40. Let's look at it here. As he taught, Jesus said, watch out for the teachers of the law. They like to walk around in flowing robes and be greeted with respect in the marketplaces, have the most important seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at banquets. They devour widows' houses and for a show make lengthy prayers. These men will be punished most severely. So in this first section of the two that we're comparing at the end, you could say section six here, we're seeing that Jesus criticizes some of Israel's Jewish scholars or teachers or leaders. And look here, they loved the prestige, they loved the honor, they loved what they got because of their position, right? Simply put, they were not loving God, were they? Were they loving God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength? Does that make you think they're loving God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength? Certainly not, right? No. No, they were loving what their position got them. And we see here kind of something interesting that would be easily missed. I missed it. They devour widows' houses. That's interesting because who does Jesus talk about next? A widow. Right after that, we see it talks about a widow. And we see here, Jesus sat down opposite place where the offerings were put and watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. Many rich people threw in large amounts, but a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins worth only a few cents. Calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, truly I tell you, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. They all gave out of their wealth, but she out of the, her poverty put in everything, all she had to live on. So when we compare and contrast Verses 38 through 40 and 41 through 44, we see the religious leaders who are not loving God with everything they got. And they're certainly not loving their neighbor as herself. How were they treating widows? Many of them at least. They were devouring the widows' houses, meaning they were taking advantage of them. So that's not good, right? And there's, of course, a specific reason why Mark follows up with this story of Jesus being in the temple and praising a widow. And here's the interesting part. Who are we talking about here? 
the very opposite of those people who were religious leaders that were honored and revered by everyone. This is a poor widow. She didn't hold a lot of honor in the world's eye. Not at all. Others didn't see her as important. And simply put, though, what was this woman doing with her act of offering her last two pennies? She was essentially saying, I love God with everything I got. Guys, if you miss nothing, or you, I guess, I, let me put it this way. If you don't catch anything else this morning, please catch this last part of what I'm teaching. Scripture is not teaching us this morning about how we're supposed to tithe everything we own. We know that. The Bible doesn't teach that. What we are being told this morning by this uh, story of the widow being praised by Jesus is that she was giving everything she got to God in a sense or essentially she was loving God with all of her heart, all of her soul, all of her mind, and all of her strength. And here's the irony. You guys catch this. This is the irony. She was giving an offering to who? She was supporting who? Who? The very people that were essentially devouring people like her, if not herself. Jesus just got done condemning those scribes and leaders and saying, you devour women's widows' households. You take advantage of what little they have. And here she comes in and she gives what little she has. She's essentially, yes, she's giving it to God and supporting the temple, but she's also supporting those who are not leading her well. She's loving the people that aren't very lovable. She's an example of what I've just kind of walked us through this morning. She is this commendable woman who's loving God with everything in her and loving her neighbor as herself, even when her neighbor isn't all that neighborly or lovable. I don't want us to miss this. This is very much why Mark put them back to back. In fact, he's teaching us what Jesus was saying. You want to know the greatest commandments? It's to love God with everything you and to love your neighbor as yourself. How do we practically do that, Jesus? And then we see it follows up with two examples of how not to do it, like the religious leaders, and how to do it, like the woman, the widow, who put in those two pennies. Let me ask you just a couple of closing questions. How much poorer, how, how more inferior did the widow become when she put in her last two little pennies? I mean, think about this. You guys, if I came to your church, it wasn't your pastor, and I had no savings, no assets, and I came in and literally I had two pennies in my pocket, and I put them in the offering how much poorer and less influential as a person would I really be? Not any at all, right? No, I mean, it isn't the quantity of her offering that was significant, right? It was the quality. It, it's definitely teaching us. Jesus is saying, I am interested in the, quant the quality of your love. The religious leaders, everyone would have thought from the, outside looking in, well, those are the people that love God the most. They're the religious leaders. They're the ones that lead us and teach us about God. They are connected to God closer than anyone. This woman who's a widow has no real honor in society. What does she have to say to us about God and loving God? A whole lot. And I think what I want to close with is this. We need to remember our love for God does not come from the influence we carry in the world's eyes. Our love for God comes from basically flowing out of our love for Him, right? Everything we do should flow from our love for God. It should flow out of that. And that's exactly what we're seeing this morning with the widow. It was just so happened to be that this tithe is what Jesus was praising but I guarantee you the woman was loving God with everything in her and this is just the example of how it just flowed out of her and that's the call that, that Jesus is saying if you want to love God with everything in you 
and to love your neighbor as yourself, know the scriptures. Know the power of God. Know where that longevity to love others who think differently and act differently and are unkind to you comes from. It comes from knowing that God lives in you and helps you to love those who are unlovable. And know that it isn't about influence. It isn't about your socioeconomic status. It isn't about how much prestige you have or how others perceive you. It's truly about your love for God. And out of that flow, God is going to be, he's going he's to be honored, right? We want to honor God with our lives. And so let's close in prayer as we reflect on this. And I got a challenge for you. You ready? Before we close, I got a challenge for you. I want to encourage all of us this week. I'm going to put this on our Facebook page. Let's read 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 8. And also reread Mark 12, 28 through 31. Those are the greatest commandments that we just talked about. And then, Mark, and then of course, 1 Corinthians 13 talks all about love. So let's do that this week. Let's read it often this week and reflect on it. Let's pray. God, we just ask that you would, you would help us to reflect on your word. God, that you'd help us to reflect on what your word teaches about loving you and loving others. Help us, God, to honor you with our, with our actions. The fruit of our lives is just the actions of our lives. God, help us to honor you with our lives. Help us to produce good fruit. Your word tells us that your Holy Spirit lives in us and helps us to persevere in this life. So God, we are looking to you to help us to love you better and to love others better. Not just today, but in all the rest of the days we have here on this earth. God, help us to continue to produce good fruit. And Lord, I pray that we reflect on your word this week. Help us to reflect on what is written in 1 Corinthians 13 about love. Let's, let's reflect on more of what Mark 12 says about the greatest commandments of loving you and loving others. And God, help us to see how we can practically put those verses into practice in our lives. And God, we thank you for this time. We ask that you just would bless our Sunday school time. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.